Thank you to our band. We appreciate you. <clears throat> First, let me say I'm glad to be back here. This is my home church. And uh, as I look out on your faces, I see quite a few of you who, who weren't even around at the time. But I left here in 1985 when I left to go to seminary. And it's good to be back here. Uh, seeing old friends and trying to remember names. Not doing too well at the names part. In our scripture this morning, comes from the book of Exodus. Now, if you're anything like me, you may remember trying to read through the Bible. When I was eight, I got my first Bible, and I decided I should read this thing. Straight through. I mean, if you're going to read a book, you start on page one, right? And go to the last page. And you may be as aware as I am that for anyone who starts reading the Bible straight through, they begin to get bogged down, long about Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, and usually by Deuteronomy, that kind of slams the door. Exodus starts out with a lot of good action. We have... Jesus meeting God at the burning bush and getting his call to go down and free the slaves from Egypt. And then we get all those stories of Egypt, the plagues and the Pharaoh and so on. And the exodus itself as the people leave slavery and go out into the wilderness. And then they complain a lot and God sends them water when they need it. Sends manna and quail. But then as we get toward the end of this book... Moses goes up to talk to God, and in addition to getting the book of the law, he's given all the instructions on how they're going to worship God. And it's going to take a special place. Eventually it will be a temple, but it starts out as a tent. The tent of meeting. The tabernacle. It's called different things in different translations, but we all have pretty much the same picture of it because God gives Moses explicit instructions. He tells what color the curtains are to be and how many rings you ought to have on each curtain to put, it through the rod, put the rods through the, the hangings. And he tells us what color the hangings are to be and what the instruments are to look like that tend to the altar. And there are all these fancy instructions. And you may think that's kind of pointless. In fact, it really seems pointless the second time you get to it and you hear all those instructions a second time. Anytime you see something in the Bible that is repeated, especially in the Old Testament, count on it. That means this is important, folks. Pay attention. So we get all these instructions. All the finest materials that are going to go into making this Ark of the Covenant and the Tent of Meeting and Moses goes out to ask the people to bring their very best and to get their very best craftspeople to make all these things that are going to be for the worship of God. So we start in chapter 35, starting at verse 21, and then we go on to chapter 36. And they came. Everyone whose heart was stirred and everyone whose spirit was willing and brought the Lord's offering to be used for the tent of meeting and for all its service and for the sacred vestments. So they came, both men and women, all who were of a willing heart, brought brooches and earrings and signet rings and pendants, all sorts of gold objects, everyone bringing an offering of gold to the Lord. And everyone who possessed blue or purple or crimson yarn or fine linen or goat's hair, or tanned ram skins, or fine leather, brought them. Everyone who could make an offering of silver or bronze brought it as the Lord's offering. And everyone who possessed acacia wood of any use in the work brought it. All the skillful women spun with their hands and brought what they had spun in blue and purple and crimson yarns and fine linen. All the women whose hearts moved them to use their skill spun the goat's hair. 
And the leaders brought onyx stones and gems to be set in the ephod and the breastpiece, and spices and oil for the light, and for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense. All the Israelites, men and women, whose hearts made them willing to bring anything for the work that the Lord had commanded by Moses to be done, brought it as a free will offering to the Lord. They still kept bringing Moses' free will offerings every morning, so that all the artisans who were doing every sort of task on the sanctuary came each from the task being performed and said to Moses, the people are bringing much more than enough for doing the work that the Lord has commanded. So Moses gave command and word was proclaimed throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering but the, for the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing for what they had already brought was more than enough to do all the work. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> As I look out on some of you, I realize you're probably too young to remember this, but I see a few who may remember a song by the Beatles. It was, in fact, on their last album, and it was the last song they laid down on a track before they broke up. It was a song by George Harrison called I, Me, Mine. Now, I remember when I first heard this song, and they're singing, I, I, me, mine, I, I, me, mine, and I couldn't figure out what they were saying. But in fact, George was writing a song about how difficult it was to keep the lads, as we used to call them, to keep them together as a group. Things were getting very tense with the Beatles, and it was almost a foregone conclusion that they weren't going to stay together. And George wrote about how they were struggling because they all had their different ideas. I, me, mine. That was perhaps an important song for the Beatles to sing, but I think it's an important message for all of us because I think that song speaks to the human condition. I, me, mine, my stuff, my possessions. That's what I focus on. What do I want? What do I need? And so we keep adding more and more to what we have. Some of you may be like me and have had garages that were so packed with stuff you weren't sure what was in there. Or maybe you go that next step and get a storage unit. Do you know that the U.S. has more storage units per capita than any other place in the world? It's no surprise, is it? Mine. My stuff. The stuff I need. Now, part of the problem with this is that when we look at ourselves, when we take an honest look, we acknowledge that we're a bit selfish. I want my stuff. You've maybe seen the bumper sticker that says, the one who dies with the most toys wins. And we'll joke about how, for adults, the toys are just more expensive than they are for the kids. And yet we know that ultimately, everything we have comes from God. We know that. People of faith are well aware that there's nothing that we've done by ourselves that we can't say, God allowed me to have this. Now, that doesn't mean that God thinks I need every last gadget, every last electronic that's in the store. But I know the very fact that I can think about getting those has to do with God giving me that possibility. And when you come down to it, everything we have that is necessary for life, there's not a question at all. God has given it to us. Down to the very breath we breathe, 
down to the very life we live. Yeah, it's not mine. It's God's. And yet, in the midst of that, we're never quite sure if we have enough. We're not sure if we have enough money. We're not sure if we have enough food in the pantry. We're not sure if we have enough security to get us through our later years. We're never quite sure. In fact, what will it take to fill up that emptiness? I think in so much of our society, that is the issue. An emptiness inside. And maybe one more thing will fill me up. If you've never had a chance to see it, I invite you to Google the story of stuff. Anyone seen the story of stuff? I'm sure some of you have. And I'm not seeing a single hand out there. Okay, you all have to Google the story of stuff. It is outstanding. It's a little 20 minute animated film. And it talks about the stuff. The stuff we have in our society. Where does it come from? What does it take to make it? How does it get to us? And then what do we do with it? She says on there that 90% of the stuff that we buy is gone within six months or useless. Stuff. We like our stuff. You may remember the rich young man who came to Jesus asking, how can I inherit eternal life? And Jesus quizzes him, asks about all the commandments, and he's doing pretty well on those. Oh, I have obeyed the commandments. I haven't broken those. Pretty upstanding young man. And then the gospel says, Jesus looked at him and loved him and said, there's only one thing remaining. Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And the gospel goes on to say, the young man went away very sorrowful for he had many possessions. That is the problem with our possessions, isn't it? Instead of us owning them, they begin to own us. And I look at stories like monks who give up everything to go live in a community with virtually nothing. I look at the story of Mother Teresa who lived in absolute poverty going to Calcutta and living there the rest of her life so that she could help people. And we say, I'm not sure I'm willing to give up that much. But then we turn to the Bible. We say, what kind of words of wisdom do we get here? What does the Bible tell us? We look at this story of Exodus the people bringing everything they had. They were so excited to be able to take part in building this tent of meeting, this tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant. They were so excited, they rushed. They vied with each other to take the rings off their fingers and the brooches off their clothes and to take them, to give everything they had the finest wood, the most beautiful wall hangings, the yarns that were dyed beautifully because they wanted to give them. Why? Because they were a people filled with gratitude. Now, we know that the Israelites weren't always filled with gratitude. We know that they often mumbled and murmured against Moses. But by this point, we're later on in the story of the Exodus. They look back and they see what God has done. They were slaves in Egypt. And suddenly, miraculously, they were set free. And once they're set free, God placed a cloud in front of them and a fiery pillar at night so that they would know where they should go. And when they weren't supposed to go anywhere, the cloud would stay there and so they'd stay in camp. And then the cloud would pick up and move and they'd follow it. A God who was always with them. 
a God who always provided. Providence, that's our word providence, our provider. Moses, we don't have any water out here in the wilderness. Now I'll tell you, last January I was in Israel and Egypt, down on the Sinai Peninsula. And I looked at what they called the wilderness, and honestly, I don't know how anybody could live there. I mean, I've been in some deserts in North America. I've been in some places that we call wilderness, which are absolutely beautiful. But there in Israel and Egypt, the wilderness was rock, sand. There were so few plants, I couldn't see how even the ibexes could travel far enough to get enough to eat. And so here's this whole group of people traveling through. Moses, we need water. Here, check out this rock. Moses, we need food. And God sends manna. And then quail. And an interesting thing in the manna story is that they're told that they're supposed to go out in the morning and pick up this manna, a certain amount for each person. No more, no less. And by the way, God will provide for Saturday, for the Sabbath, when you can pick up twice as much the day before, so it will tide you over for the Sabbath. But on the other days, just get as much as you're told. And they discovered if they got greedy and tried to get too much, that it would simply spoil by the second day, except on the Sabbath. But I love this line in the story of the manna. They went out and gathered it, and those who gathered little did not have too little. And those who gathered much did not have too much. In other words, in God's economy, Everybody is provided for. And when the people came to Moses trying to help with the tent of meeting, they knew that God had provided for them water and food and a place to go. And by now they believed that somewhere off there was a promised land. And God's going to get us there. They believed it. And they were filled with gratitude. They were filled with gratitude and it made them a generous people. We find this story repeated in other places in the Bible when the people came back from Babylon. They were so filled with gratitude at having been set loose from captivity that once again they have to build the city of Jerusalem. They build its walls, they build a new temple. And once again, they're eager to shower gifts on the priests so that things can be rebuilt. The scriptures also tell us about the widow that Jesus pointed out. She came down to the front with two little copper coins. So little they were called mites. And she dropped them in. And Jesus said, look at that. She's given everything she had. Was Jesus praising her because she just left herself with nothing to live on? Well, frankly, two little mites weren't going to help her live for very long. Jesus knew it would take the rest of the community to help her live. But what he saw was that a woman who was so filled with gratitude, we don't know why, perhaps just for life itself, but she gave all she had. Jesus saw the generosity that comes out of gratitude. Wanting to give and then give some more. And that's what we find from the scripture. That we are called to a life of gratitude because first of all, if we don't recognize that God has given us everything, we are truly filled with ingratitude. But if we are grateful to God for that, if we look around us and recognize how good God has been, if we recognize that when we say how much is enough, that we already have enough and to spare, then that makes us a generous people. St. Paul 
talked about the fruits of the Spirit. Now, this is not the gifts of the Spirit. You all have gifts that the Holy Spirit has given you, and they vary from one person to another. And there may be pastors and teachers. There are helpers. There are healers. There are prophets. Those are the gifts of the Spirit. But Paul said there are fruits of the Spirit. And these are fruits that every Christian can receive, can live out. The fruits of the Spirit are those things that grow within us when we allow the Holy Spirit to take hold of our lives. The fruits of the Spirit are those parts of Christ's Spirit that make us truly imitate Christ. We become like him. And Paul starts out, the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. And then, I always like to use the New Revised Standard Version for this because not every translation uses the same words. But in the NRSV, the next one is generosity. And I love to think about how that is a fruit of the Spirit. That when the Spirit lives in us, it means we are so filled with gratitude for what God has done. When the Spirit lives in us, we simply want to be generous. We want to share. We want to give our gifts to God to say thank you. This is a fruit of the Spirit. And notice the first fruit that Paul mentions is joy. When we are filled with generosity, we find a joy uncompared. Talk to some of our church members. Some of those who are tithers or go beyond the tithe. And ask them what it feels like to be generous people. It is a joyful thing. So then when we say how much is enough, we begin to say how much is enough to give. What am I supposed to be giving? We give as we are generously called to do. Now it's true, the biblical standard through the years has been a tithe, a tenth, or a proportionate portion of what we have. But we say we're Christians, we're freed from the law. We don't have to obey those old laws. And so then we say, okay, then what will the Spirit do with you if it truly lives in you? What are you called to give? How much is enough? I can tell you, if we had a church full of people who gave just at that biblical standard, didn't even go beyond it, we would have a finance committee that would say, wow, what are we going to do with all this money? We would have a missions committee that would say, We've got lots of ideas of what we can do. We have an education committee that would be thrilled to use some of that for our education program. We have people doing outreach who would say, we know how we can reach more people. But it starts first with the spirit, the spirit living within. It starts first with our gratitude. Can we give thanks to God? And if we do, how much do we give? Is it something more than the words of our mouth? Is there a way that we can truly show that we are a generous people? Generosity will bring us close to Christ. Now, this isn't something to beat ourselves up over. It's not a matter of going home and saying, oh, I know, I know, I just don't give enough. I ought to do better. That's not what it's about. The fruits of the Spirit come when we invite the Spirit to come in us, to live in us, when we find the joy that comes from letting Christ center our lives. And then we find that we become truly a loving joyous, generous people. May it be so. Let us pray. Almighty God, 
we know that we often ignore you, we often take things for granted, and we fail to recognize how much you have cared for us and provided all that we need. Turn our hearts, we pray, that we might be truly filled with gratitude for you and all you have given us. Gratitude especially for your Son, for in him we have truly been made new. Oh God, we pray today for all those who are in our prayers, those who are suffering from illness, those who mourn because of death. We ask for your healing hand where it's needed and your comfort where people are hurting. God, we pray today for those who are lost in the midst of the darkness of mental illness, for those who are caught in depression, for those who are jobless, for those who are homeless. We ask you to be in their lives and help them know they're not alone. Help us also to be those who reach out in your name. God, we pray for people around the world who today are hungry and don't know where their meal will come from. People who have no shelter. People who are running from war. Help them all, we pray. And help us to find those things that make for peace. Oh God, we especially pray today for those children who are in detention centers. We pray for especially for those children who have not yet been reunited with their families. Be with them, give them comfort, help them to have workers who truly care for them, and help us to find ways out of the mess that we sometimes get ourselves into. Oh God, we know that you can do all things and that you guide us and lead us in all that we need and all that we do. So touch us, we pray. Help us to be more like Christ, that we might truly bring about his reign on earth. We pray these things in his name, and we pray the prayer which he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>